one of the big stories of our age is that there's a lot of co-optation happening. So you think about a Facebook, and as you say, Facebook is great at harnessing our participation. It's the biggest platform in the world. There are two billion of us doing that. Um, so clearly it's, it's terrifically effective as a new power model, and yet you think about our relationship with Facebook, and is Facebook really making us more powerful? It, it isn't, right? It's extracting a lot of economic value from us without sharing any of it with us, even though that value is all based on our own content. You know, we're not sharing in the governance, we're not making decisions about it, we don't understand the algorithm that we know is having such an impact on us. Um, and so all of that creates this dynamic that we in the book call, you know, these participation farms, where we are all very busy participating, right? But the farmer, which in this case is Facebook, is really fencing us in. Welcome to Future Squared, the podcast all about corporate innovation, entrepreneurship, and self-improvement. My name is Steve Glaveski, and each week I'll bring you conversations with thought leaders such as Kevin Kelly, Brad Feld, Steve Blank, Gretchen Rubin, Tim Harford, Adam Grant, Tim O'Reilly, Tyler Cowan, and many, many more on topics that will help you gain a distinct advantage, not only in the world of creativity and innovation, but in your entire professional and personal life. Each and every Friday, I'll bring you Fast Fix Friday, some short, high-impact and easily digestible insights to have you finishing your week on a high. Future Squared is powered by Collective Campus, a corporate innovation school, consultancy and startup accelerator that works with large organizations to help them unlock their people's often latent potential to create more impact for humanity and lead more fulfilling lives. If your organization needs help coming up with ideas, testing and turning those ideas into reality, creating a culture of innovation, or partnering with startups, visit collectivecampus.io. So without further ado, let's get into today's podcast. Welcome back to Future Squared for episode number 241 with Jeremy Hymans. Jeremy is the co-founder and CEO of Purpose, an organization headquartered in New York that builds and supports social movements around the world. He's the co-founder of GetUp, an Australian political organization with more members than all of Australia's political parties combined. He's been named one of Fast Company's most creative people in business and received the Ford Foundation's 75th Anniversary Visionary Award. With Henry Timms, Jeremy is co-author of the book New Power, How Power Works in Our Hyperconnected World and How to Make It Work for You. Their thinking on New Power was featured as the big idea in Harvard Business Review and as one of 2014's top TED Talks with over 1.25 million views and also by CNN as one of the top 10 ideas to change the world in 2015. We explored a number of topics during our conversation, including one, what new power is, how it differs to old power, and what it means for today's organizations, two, how new power can be used for good and evil, and three, lessons from the likes of Lego, Ted, and Bodie McBoatface. You'll learn that and much more in my conversation with the one and only Jeremy Hymans. Welcome to the show, Jeremy. Thank you for having me, Steve. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you in on the show, and you're joining us all the way from Dallas, Texas, in support of your new book, uh, New Power, How Power Works in Our Hyper-Connected World and How to Make It Work for You. How's the uh, book tour coming along? It's going well. I'm, I, to be clear, I'm not, uh, you can probably hear from my accent, I, I don't live in Texas and I'm not a Texan, <laughs> but uh, it, is, uh, it is fun to be here. There are some there are some things that Australians and Texans have in common, I think. Oh, such as? Well, you know, there's that kind of outsider mentality. Yeah. Um, so uh, some some version of that plays out in Texas in like slightly different ways, but uh, you know, there are probably parts of Queensland that are a lot like parts of Texas. Yeah, I can imagine, and I guess Texas, depending on where you are in Texas, can be quite different as well. I mean, Austin is kind of like a very left-leaning Silicon Valley-esque part of of Texas versus, say, San Antonio, which are quite quite different. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Although San Antonio has a uh, had a, uh, a Democratic mayor um, who uh, is actually a pretty interesting uh, political figure. Mm. But that's for another conversation. That maybe. is, that is <laughs> for another conversation. So as you said, you're not from Dallas, you are from Australia, and I'm sure our audience would have worked that out just by hearing your accent. And you've been involved in politics, Jeremy, since you were eight years old, running media campaigns, lobbying leaders on issues like children's rights. I mean, how did you get to be involved in politics at such a young age? 
stage. Yeah, well, it's a, you know, it's a little strange story, but, you know, this was the late Cold War, and there was this um, little scene of, uh, of kids who became these kind of peace ambassadors. So I got onto this circuit, and I ended up having this kind of uh, unusual childhood where I would travel the world. Um, I met with world leaders. I met with uh, Nobel laureates. Um, mm-hmm. I campaigned on all sorts of issues, um, mostly connected to to uh, the nuclear kind of disarmament process and uh, the environmental problems that were sort of emerging at that time into into public consciousness. So it was pretty funny childhood. I did sound like I was 40 when I was 10, <laughs> which is uh, which is was slightly strange to the adults around me. Oh, that's awesome. And it sounds like that's just something you've run with. And, you know, 30 years later, you're still going strong. Um, obviously, the founder of Purpose, uh, the founder of The Get Up, and now the book has made its appearance. It's been on the shelves for about four weeks, and it's received critical acclaim from some really big names. I mean, the likes of Richard Branson, Reid Hoffman from LinkedIn, and Adam Grant have given it kudos. So congratulations on the success of the book thus far. Thank you so much. It's been it's been really fantastic. Uh, you work on these things for a couple of years in a cave. Uh, admittedly, for me, it was my uh, it was a side hustle rather than a main uh, a main job. Mm. And uh, you know, you never know what people are going to say or think of it. And so, it's just such a joy to see people kind of taking the ideas, starting to adapt them and run with them in different ways, which is kind of the whole point of the book, really. So, uh, mm. it's been um, it's been really encouraging. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I had the opportunity to read the book myself a couple of weeks ago, and as I was reading through, I was immediately thinking, well, how might this apply to our business? How might it apply to the startups that we work with? And there are just so many things that they need to be thinking about. But I mean, just to take a step back, the book was born out of a Harvard Business Review article that you penned with your co-author, Henry Timms, about three and a half years ago. And for our audience's uh, benefit, that article is called Understanding New Power, and we'll include that in the show notes. But before we go on, I mean, what are old power structures based on, and in what key ways do they differ to new power? Yeah, so look, we wanted to create um, in this HBR article and, and now obviously in the book, a really compelling, simple frame to help people understand like what was really changing in the mm. world. And to us, it seemed like the discussion was not one that was just about technology, because technology is always going to change, but really about power, where the power was changing, and if so, how. So we describe these two very different ways of exercising power in the 21st century. Mm-hmm. One is old power, the traditional exercise of power, the kind of power that you can hoard up, that you can um, you know, use, deploy like a currency mm-hmm. uh, and spend that power. Uh, and it's uh, you know, very familiar to most of us because most of our social institutions run on, on old power uh, and our political institutions. And then there's new power. New power works less like a currency. It's not something you can hoard up and more like a current. So it's something that surges uh, like water or like electricity. It's, it's uh, something that flows. So your job with new power is to figure out how to channel the energy that it creates. And new power is really what we think of as this sort of essential 21st century skill that we all now need, which is this ability to conjure the crowd, to manage the crowd, uh, to, to to deploy its energy to get the outcomes that you seek. Mm. So as you said there, um, new power is not a currency. Um, it is open. Um, I guess one would say that old power is more of a zero-sum game, whereas new power is more of a case of, say, one plus one equals three. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. So I think um, you're absolutely right. Old power is zero-sum. With new power, you know, you've you've got this this potentially surging exponential energy that you can deploy. Now, as we argue, that energy is not always positive, right? So I think at first when um, we started to see this explosion of new forms of participation, right, whether Mm -hmm. it was Facebook or whether it was these new political movements that were powered by uh, by by technology and by the internet, we all thought, oh, this is going to be great. Everything's going to be democratized. Everyone's going to get more powerful. And those things didn't really play out, right? So what we're actually seeing is this new power, which is both a method of exercising power and a mindset, is being deployed by some of the best, uh, most inspiring people in the world, as well as by some of the most scary. Mm. And that's, I think, the central dynamic of our age that we explore in the book. 
Yeah, and um, you've put forward a number of different, um, well, there's a table in the book that I'm referring to called old power values versus new power values. And when I look at that, I mean, I look at some of the old power values such as managerialism, institutionalism, um, specialization, exclusivity, competition. And then I look at some of the new power values such as open source, collaboration, crowd wisdom, sharing, informal, radical transparency. And, you know, we work with a lot of large organizations. And to me, it seems like so many of them, if not the vast overwhelming majority, are still operating with these old power values and, and the models that we'll, we'll touch on in a, in a second. But how am I embodying this, these old power values affect their businesses in what is very much starting to become a new power world. Yeah, well, so I think, you know, this is arriving at the doorstep of a lot of businesses' feet, whether they like it or not, right? So, you know, you see these kind of digital crowds um, that are coming up around issues um, mm -hmm. that kind of sweep at companies' feet. You know, the Me Too movement is a great example of that. Um, some companies have handled it well. Some companies are being swept away by those dynamics. So that's one thing. You know, you've got dynamics like attention we talk about between radical transparency and mm. the kind of confidentiality, the kind of deal making behind closed doors that you know used to be able to count on. And obviously, in this current environment, you have to be prepared for a world in which your employees are demanding salary transparency of everyone in your company. A world in which your um, you know your secrets could be could be leaked and exposed very easily. You know, we tell a story in the book that's kind of funny about a politician who's running for governor of Colorado in the U.S. right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and he he decided, well, look, I'm going to get ahead of this. And he had a bit of a colorful life. So he created a uh, he created a section on his website called Scandal and Controversy. And uh, that section includes um, his sexual history, mm -hmm. where he basically talks about yeah. all of his... Uh, all of the stuff that he's done, and that might seem absurd, but it's sort of a, it tells you something about where things are going. He, he knew that if he didn't get out in front of it, that someone else would, right? We have this term in the book that you should occupy yourself before you're occupied by others, and I think that's a dynamic that a lot of businesses need to start getting their head around. You know, they're also grappling with a bunch of dynamics in which, you know, their employees want to be makers. They want to, they want to be out of just one lane. They want to be in multiple lanes, which is sort of a challenge to the very stratified uh, models that, you know, a more managerial approach to business, you know, has, has fostered. You've got a model in which, as I'm sure you've talked about on this podcast before, you know, a lot of people want to feel like founders, mm -hmm. even within big companies, right? So how do you feed that founder feeling? Um, what does it take to do that? You've got a dynamic where people are getting feedback from the tech platforms in their lives, like Instagram or even LinkedIn. They're getting that feedback constantly. It's validating. Uh, there's a lot of collaboration and interaction happening. And then they're going into the traditional workplace. And if they're lucky, they get a performance review once a year. And that's creating a lot of tensions, right, in a whole bunch of contexts in business. Yeah, and um, I think uh, there's definitely parallels between the new power values you've identified and some of the entrepreneurial movements and methodologies, particularly when I look at, say, the agile methodology and some of the new power values. For example, you've identified self-organization. There's elements such as small teams moving quickly. Now, these traits that embody entrepreneurship uh, embody the agile movement and also the new power values. And if organizations, like you said, aren't giving them that constant feedback loop that comes with not just necessarily I mean the constant feedback that comes with say social media but that can apply not just to performance reviews but also the nature of your work I mean if you're engaged on a 12-month project the benefits of which you won't see until that very very last day you know fingers crossed you've done the right thing that can be very I suppose when it comes to employee morale it can mitigate it somewhat whereas if you've got that constant feedback loop of constantly shipping code or whatever it is to your customers and getting that feedback, um, you're far more likely to be engaged with your work. I think that's exactly right. And I think the, the, the approaches we profile in the book that are really successful are ones that um, are not just kind of algorithmic so, mm -hmm. or, or technical solutions. So we, we, we actually are very critical of holacracy. And I'm sure most of your listeners are familiar with mm -hmm. holacracy. It's a management philosophy that has become pretty fashionable in some companies, particularly in, in Silicon Valley, which is all about self-managing teams um, without bosses, which sounds great, right? But actually the way it's implemented 
is it so doctrinal and process obsessed that it imposes more constraints on people than uh, traditional hierarchies do. And so the people's, people's experience with holacracy is that they feel dehumanized. Um, and if you look at holacracy, it's got a constitution that, uh, you know, would, would be, uh, you know, that would befit the 19th century. Uh, so it's this dynamic where, yes, uh, agile methodologies are certainly um, part of a dynamic that creates more of this feedback, creates more sense of ownership, but you have to really think about that from a human perspective. Yeah. How do you get real humans feeling uh, like they have a sense of ownership? Um, and sometimes you can mistake process for genuinely giving people more agency. And I think that's a mistake that some uh, technologists and some in the Valley are making. Yeah, and just on holacracy, I mean, I guess I'll use that as a segue because holacracy itself to me seems like something that on the surface of it might have new power values, but it's very much when you when you take away the sheets, it's operating on old power model. Like you said, lots of process and it's dehumanizing. And you've put forward this um, quadrant in your book where you've looked at organizations who perhaps have new power values, but they're operating on an old power model. And earlier in our conversation, you mentioned how, you know, when Facebook came along, we we're going to democratize media and everything else, yeah. but it hasn't really worked out that way because organizations like Facebook, despite having working on a new power model, they have old power values. Yes, exactly. So, you know, really one of the big stories of our age is that there's a lot of co-optation happening. So mm -hmm. you think about a Facebook, and as you say, Facebook is great at harnessing our participation. It's the biggest platform in the world. There are two billion of us doing that. Um, so clearly it's, it's terrifically effective as a new power model, and yet you think about our relationship with Facebook, and is Facebook really making us more powerful? It, it isn't, right? It's extracting a lot of economic value from us without sharing any of it with us, even though that value is all based on our own content. You know, we're not sharing in the governance. We're not making decisions about it. We don't understand the algorithm that we know is having such an impact on us. Um, and so all of that creates this dynamic that we in the book call, you know, these participation farms, mm -hmm. where we are all very busy participating, right? But the farmer, which in this case is Facebook, is really fencing us in. And the fact that we can't actually leave Facebook easily, right? We can't take our data out. We can't take our friends out in a meaningful way. We can't move it from, an, from Facebook to another platform is really, you know, um, the ultimate sign of, of that um, power relationship that we have with Facebook. So, you know, that's a concern because, you know, unless uh, we start figuring out how to push back against platforms that are seeking to have that kind of relationship with us, we're going to see a lot more participation but that participation is not necessarily going to make more people more powerful. On that topic of Facebook, I suppose, not, uh, well, extracting more value than perhaps they create, and the jury's probably out on that one. That, to me, reminds me of a book released by Tim O'Reilly, so the you know spearhead of the Web 2.0 open source movement, head of uh, O'Reilly Media, um, called What's the Future and Why It's Up to Us. And in this book, he put forward a business model map for the next economy, um, and he called out things like managed by algorithm, talent on demand, um, augmented workers, services on demand, networked marketplaces, and things of that nature. And just those different variables that jump out there. I mean, he, what he kept talking about was the business model for the new economy is about creating more value than you extract. And I guess now we're seeing the tide shifting against Silicon Valley where, you know, for 20 or so years, it was very much do whatever you want. You guys are awesome creating all this technology. But now people are finally pushing back and saying, well, you're actually, in many cases, extracting more value than you're creating. You're putting all these apps in the world that are hooking us and making us look at our phone every five minutes. I mean, it seems like navigating this shift from old, old power to new power is a very delicate one for organizations to be walking that line. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the, the Tim's very thoughtful on this and we've, we've had the chance to speak with him about it. I think the... Uh, the, you know, there are different dynamics whether you're, you start from a new power place or an old power place, right? So you mm -hmm. think about the Facebooks, the Ubers. The dynamic for them is how do you actually create a genuine community around what you do? Um, how do you build on your new power strengths, right, um, and not end up um, having this deep chasm between, you know, your rhetoric and, and the reality? Uh, the dynamic for old power institutions is they often don't really have those core new power skills, right? They don't know how to engage the crowd. They don't know how to create 
these kinds of extraordinarily large, dense networks. So there's a set of skills they need to learn, and they have to do a bunch of um, shifting in the way that they think. But the important thing to note is our argument in the book is not, you know, it's all about new power, forget old power. The argument in the book is really that the most effective organizations blend both, the Mm -hmm. most effective organizations are skilled in both, and they know when to use which one. And, you know, everyone from, we talk about the NRA, the National Rifle Association in the U.S., you know, not my favorite organization, but, but they're very effective at um, mobilizing the crowd and creating that intensity, and they're very effective at that old power repertoire of kind of reigning by fear, uh, establishing their authority from the top down. So organizations that can do both are doing very well. Mm. And, uh, I mean, on that, you mentioned earlier that some darker, more sinister elements of today's sort of global society are co-opting uh, new power models um, such as ISIS. Well, right. So ISIS is sort of the ultimate example of that kind of co-optation, right, where uh, it you know, has an extraordinarily uh, old power <laughs> uh, proposition, which is like, let's reestablish a medieval theocracy, mm-hmm. let's subjugate women, you name it. But the way they spread their ideology is very new power. So they offer their supporters enormous agency to define that ideology, to um, uh, adapt it to whatever audience they're targeting. So we tell the story in the book of a young Scottish schoolgirl who basically takes the ISIS ideology, uh, becomes a recruiter for ISIS. She finds her way from Scotland to, to Syria, and she then just, you know, perfectly adapts it to how you get other schoolgirls from um, the West to come over. You know, she creates a Tumblr with emojis, with memes. She helps um, these girls get over their concerns about leaving their family. She creates community, a network online. These skills, um, you know, are very potent. And, you know, we talk about how the U.S. government's response was incredibly old power. You know, they think that the way they can take on ISIS is just by, you know, airdropping leaflets on civilian populations, Um and so that's not going to work in a new power world. Yeah, yeah. I remember uh, reading that in the book, and there was a tagline that the Secretary's Department put out. Do you remember that tagline? Right. Well, so basically what happened was the State Department then creates a Twitter account, mm-hmm. which is sort of a, is its attempt to uh, take on the social media battlefield against ISIS. And the Twitter account um, is called Think Again, Turn Away, and they use the seal of the U.S. State Department mm-hmm. as their profile picture which is probably not the right messenger if you're trying to dissuade potential jihadists um, not to join ISIS. So, you know, it's it's a symbol of the gap that um, that we that, that that these old power organizations have in adapting to these changes and in a world in which the people who can mobilize best are winning. Those of us who don't want a world of the kind that ISIS um, has promoted, we need to get better at this because um, a lot of the world's most extreme actors, the climate deniers, the terrorists, the political extremists, um, the white supremacists, many of these groups are using new power to mobilize around their own ideas. Yeah, and I think um, we've seen in, in the, the Department of Defense in the U.S. about 10 to 15 years ago, they had issues with their um, – Feed, their own feedback loop when they're out in the field um, because it was very much a top-down command and control type of environment. And since then, they've gone on to look at their commanders out in the field as, say, entrepreneurs, and they're empowered to make their own decisions. And therefore, that feedback loop speeds up because they can observe, they can orient, they can decide, they can act much faster. So I guess what we're seeing there is a shift in values um, from command and control to empower and facilitate those outcomes and empower your people to make those decisions. I guess that's kind of what we need to start seeing within these organizations as well. And something you talked about there with the State Department not really understanding the game. And if I look at today's organizations, you got so much by way of, say, generational divide where much of the power is consolidated by people who have these um, old power values, yet many of the people joining their organizations perhaps embody new power values. So you'll see a bit of a conflict arising within many large established organizations today. Yeah, that's exactly right. You see that playing out in all arenas. You often have this tension between the sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the younger folks who are often steeped in these new power values who have really intense expectations around I want to shape my world. Um, I want to participate. I want these feedback loops. 
um, and, uh, you, and, and you have those who, who just are not steeped in that. And so one of the big questions that we explore in the book is, you know, how do you, how do you bridge that? And our argument is, frankly, that, you know, we can't just lament the days in which, you know, uh, no one asked for feedback and people just, uh, you know, stoically carried on or where people knew their place and slotted into neatly defined roles mm -hmm. because those days are over, right? And so we, we need to readapt the way, uh, the way our institutions are structured around these changes. And that doesn't mean giving up those institutions. It actually means preserving them. Yeah. And um, on, on blending the old power models with new power values, I think one great example, I mean, we've talked about a few more sinister examples, but one great example you put forward in the book is of TED, um, the global keynote conference uh, movement, if, if you will, because they've effectively got this model, which is all based on new power values. You know, let's share ideas and everything else. But underneath the surface, the independent TEDx events usually require so much, um, well, there's so much oversight that goes into running an, ind an independent event and so many boxes that need to be ticked. But it is that sort of blending of new power values with an old power model that seems to work. I think that's right. I think, you know, TED is very effective and partly because they've, they've got both new power and old power. So they've still got this very exclusive conference that, you know, you have to pay thousands of dollars to go to, that only a small number of people uh, can attend. Now, keep in mind that there used to be a time where that was, that was all that TED was. Mm. So if you weren't in the room in California for their conference, you never saw these talks. And then in 2010, they put their talks online. And then in the, in the years that followed, they created this TEDx model, which was about the democratization of, of, the, of the structure of the talks. And so now they've built this elaborate system where they have the exclusivity and, and kind of luxury brand, premium brand of TED. And there are certain um, elements of the TED model that remain that way. But they also have a much larger community of people who are engaging with that brand, who are making, organizing TEDx conferences, who are um, giving talks, who are translating on a volunteer basis um, the existing talks, uh, who are doing all manner of things. You know, this identity of a TED star is no longer an identity that's simply reserved for people who go to the conference. Now, in order to have done that well, they've used a lot of old power and a lot of new power. And what you describe is they're, they're very careful to structure um, for participation. And that's one of the skills that I think businesses need that we talk about in the book, which is it isn't just about giving people more agency or having them participate. It's how you do that. It's designing systems that actually create the kind of participation that, that, that you're seeking. Mm. And systems often get the best out of people. I mean, you could have what may be construed as mediocre or just good people, but you put them in the right system and they can operate like a superstar team. So the same can be said of organizations who need to sort of balance empowerment and giving people control and self-organizing teams, but you need to balance that with some kind of process unless they're just absolute superstars. And I know Netflix, their whole policy on maintaining their innovative streak is to just pay at the very top of the market, get the very best people on board, keep process to a minimum. You know, we've got the best people. They'll make good decisions. If they don't, um, they'll be able to pick themselves up and, and rectify those issues. But not every organization is in the position of paying what Netflix pays at the top of market. Definitely. Yeah, exactly. So it's a, it's a new set of skills. And the, the, what we lay out in the book really is how you do this. You know, how do you build communities around your businesses and your organizations? How do you raise money in a different way? You know, we talk about businesses that have, you know, crowd funded their way to enormous scale. And what and what we really examine there is is even if you're not interested in doing that, like what are the skills that you need to do that? So what does it take to do that successfully and what can you learn from that skill set? Yeah, and on um, engaging crowds, whether it's to raise funds or name a ship, uh, you've, you've <laughs> called out a number of really cool stories in the book, one of them being – of Bodie McBoatface. Let's, uh, let's hear that, this story, Jeremy. Well, it's a pretty funny story. So there's a uh, British research institution called NERC that had built this 300 million pound ship. They wanted to sort of find a way to get some fanfare around it. So they asked the crowd to name their ship. 
but they didn't really know what they were doing. They, you know, the first sign of trouble was that they, they announced this via press release and they just sort of start suggesting names that the crowd should call the ship, like Endeavour, Shackleton, Adventurer. <laughs> These are not the sort of names the crowd picked. And of course, many people now know that the, the, the name that the crowd got excited about was Boaty McBoatface. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the internet, like, just absolutely just was transfixed by this idea. There was this huge influx of people voting um, in this, in what would have probably otherwise been pretty obscure. And, you know, there were all sorts of other great suggestions that got votes like, I like big boats and I cannot lie. And, uh, you know, it was a bit of a debacle, but it was an interesting one. It teaches us some things. So one, it teaches us that you've got to be very thoughtful about how you engage the crowd. You've got to have a strategy. You've got to have existing legitimacy with the crowd. You have to know what outcome you're prepared to accept um, before you go in. And, And this institution had none of those things. But also, you know, there was a big opportunity created by this because suddenly they had the world's attention and they could have potentially built, you know, a billion dollar brand around Bodie McBoatface and and its work and it could have really energized um, their focus on science. But instead they sort of shrunk from that. You know, they didn't call the ship Bodie McBoatface. They named a kind of submarine associated with it Bodie McBoatface. So you might say that they literally sunk Bodie at sea. Mm. Yeah, and I think there's a really valuable lesson in that for organizations today. I mean, we see so many companies running things like uh, idea challenges internally and getting their people to submit ideas to some kind of central repository or even engaging um, the crowd and engaging their customers and suppliers to submit ideas. But more often than not, there's no real thought put into what happens next. There's no budget allocated. There's no time allocated. So... Ultimately, it's like, well, give us your ideas, but then nothing happens with them. So your employees, your customers, your suppliers just get frustrated or disgruntled by the process. And the next time you ask them for their ideas, they're not going to contribute. So if you are looking to leverage the crowd, you need to have some sort of plan or strategy in place in so far as how you're actually going to capitalize on on that crowd. And, And whether it's ideas, whether it's funding, whether it's the name of a ship, actually doing something with that that's going to resonate with the crowd. That's right. And the people who do this well are creating, like they're structuring their businesses around some of this. So a story we tell in the book is is a story of Lego. And in the early 2000s, Lego was kind of in financial distress. They brought in a new CEO. It was it was kind of really in trouble. And uh, they looked around, like what was, what was happening in Lego that was positive that could be drawn out further? And they found there was this group that had been neglected by the company because, frankly, the company thought they were a bit weird. And they were the adult fans of Lego. They Mm -hmm. were called assholes. And basically, they um, realized that this group had um, big spending power. They also were um, able to to make amazing models. For example, most of your listeners will have probably seen those big models of famous world monuments. Mm -hmm. Those are crowd-created. So they realized that from a marketing uh, perspective, from a, uh, you know, from a revenue perspective and from a product development perspective, an innovation perspective, that this, this group of adult fans of Lego could be the basis for the resurgence of the company. And they built around that. They created whole departments devoted to engaging that group. Uh, who would meet around the world um, and gather and um, build together. They created platforms where, you know, people could suggest new models and designs and then, you know, uh, vote on the best ones and successful ones would get, um, would, would go to market and would get made. And then that would get shared back with, um, with the creators in a revenue share arrangement. These kinds of things produce some of the biggest uh, new products for Lego and were very valuable as well when they had things like the Lego movie come out where they needed to kind of go back to that community and say, okay, now everybody um, get behind this. And they had a real community. And as you say, it wasn't a one-off um, and it wasn't under-resourced. They really went there and uh, it was the making of the company. Yeah, and I mean, on harnessing the crowd as Lego did and obviously following through as well, I mean, have you done much thinking around, I know there's not much on it in the book, but around, say, the blockchain and how that might support organizations who want to better harness their employees, the crowd, customers, suppliers, you know, society? Yeah, well, I think the blockchain, you know, is promising in the way that it further decentralizes. So, Mm -hmm. you know, we talked earlier about the fact that What's happened is that a bunch of platform intermediaries have 
have created, um, uh, have concentrated a lot of power in their own hands and become very extractive. Um, and blockchain allows you to potentially have fewer of those intermediaries. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a, a world where you could do what you do when you get an Uber ride, but without Uber, right, extracting, yeah. you know, half the value off the top. Well, that's pretty cool, right? Because there's a lot more money that can go to the driver, or that's a lot more money that can go and stay in the consumer's pocket. So I think there's real opportunities when platforms become less powerful because trust and reputation systems, which obviously, you know, is key to what the blockchain offers, um, are established so that you don't need to um, be intermediated in that way. So I think that's the reason to get excited about blockchain from a new power perspective. Yeah, makes makes a lot of sense. And the last thing I wanted to touch on, Jeremy, we talked about feedback loops earlier, and we've seen these feedback loops obviously designed into our apps, our phones, our Netflix, you name it. It's 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 constantly there, and it's sucking us back into the vortex all the time. So I mean, what obligation do organizations have between, say, engineering feedback loops into their systems in order to keep people, keep the crowd engaged, well, versus giving them time and space so that they're not constantly seeking the next dopamine hit and that next hit of external validation. <laughs> right. Well, it's a great question. And it really depends on the kind of feedback that you're structuring for. So absolutely, we don't want a world in which every institution is just you know, synthesizing these like dopamine hits for everybody, that's not going to really connect people to their institutions. So if you think about government, like we think government needs to produce better feedback loops for citizens. You know, when you get a tax return, maybe we should find out more about where the tax dollars went. Maybe we should even shape a little bit more where some of those dollars go through, you know, things like participatory budgeting. Um, you know, maybe we should have the kinds of gratifying user experiences with government that we have with, you know, with uh, these platforms. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's got to be in service of feeling more connected to our institutions and more connected to each other. And so, you know, the kinds of feedback loops we talk about toward the end of the book are really different to just uh, plugging into the dopamine machine. You know, yeah. things like new power platforms that allow, there's one in the UK called Good Sam, that make it really easy for people to become emergency responders. So, you know, like you're an Uber driver, you can get a notification that someone two blocks away has had a heart attack and you can go straight there. And you, uh, you know, while the ambulance is on the way, you can be trained to help, and in some cases, to save lives. And these sorts of things bring communities together. I mean, that's one hell of a feedback loop. And and it's not based on, you know, it's not based on an evanescent like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like any tool, it's all about how you use it. So we have two minutes left, Jeremy. So I'm going to throw you into our three question lightning round. You ready to rock and roll? Let's do it. Let's do it. So question number one is, if you could work for any organization at any stage of the company life cycle, who would it be and why? <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, does it have to be a current organization or can it be like a, a past organization? It can be a past organization. Wow. All right. Well, let's think. <laughs> I uh, I don't know. I think the... <laughs> I think uh, the Russian Revolution would have been a pretty interesting wow. thing to have like a bird's eye view on. I mean, I, I, I want to be a fly on the wall when um, Lenin and Trotsky are duking it out. Yeah, so that was like the whole Bolshevik Revolution back, what, 100 years ago? Yep, yep that's it. Fans. That would have been interesting. Yeah. I don't know that I would have wanted to have been uh, caught in the crossfire. But uh, but that that was pretty fascinating. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. That's a great answer. Um one of the more unique answers we've had, I have to say. Um, we've had a lot of people say uh, Steve Jobs, and, and we were working with Steve Jobs and Wozniak back in the late 70s, but uh, that's a different story. Yeah, yeah, I bet. I bet, yeah. I just wanted the Apple stock. I, I didn't need to work with Steve Jobs. I, I would have just taken the stock. Fair enough. Uh, number two, Jeremy, is if you could ask anyone a question, dead or alive, uh, who would it be and what would you ask? Wow. These uh, these questions are um, these questions are really uh, these questions are really interesting. What would I have what would, what would I've uh, what would I've asked? Let me uh, let me give that some thought. I would have I would have asked Gough Whitlam. Did he um, did he write that speech in advance with that great line about nothing can save the Governor General, or was it just improvised? There's probably a real answer to that, but that was a great that was a great moment in politics. Well, it's it, yeah, it's an interesting one. I think. Like Martin Luther King's 
great speech, you know. I have a dream. I have a yeah. dream. That was totally improvised in the moment. Was that right? Yeah. yeah there we are. I remember so reading some that. of the best moments are, are improvised. Exactly, exactly. That's great. Um, and lucky last, obviously you've been involved in a number of different um, activism causes over the years. You founded Purpose, you founded Get Up, you've got a uh, what I hope will be a best-selling book um, out. You know, you're kicking goals on a number of fronts. What kind of rituals or routines do you have, Jeremy, to stay on top of your game? Well, you know, um, six weeks into the book tour, I can't say that I'm, um, you know, feeling sprightly. Uh, <laughs> but I think, um, I, you know, I think for me, it's actually about um, re-engaging with the people that you're doing the work for and with. So, you know, in the context of New Power, it's, it's seeing, you know, frontline nurses who are using the ideas in the book to transform hospitals that they work in or uh, political activists who've taken it up um, or businesses that are trying to create social change um, through their models who are using um, these ideas to like build deeper communities. So that stuff really energizes me because I think it's very easy to get kind of heady. So I think every, um, you know, every couple of days I try to find a way to connect to that more specifically and more directly. Um, and that keeps my energy levels, uh, my keeps my energy levels up. Beautiful. I love it. Um, okay, excellent. Well, thank you so much for giving up some time, Jeremy. People can get a copy of the book on Amazon and all places good books are sold. Um, they can hit you up on Twitter at Jeremy Hymans, um, and they can find out more about Purpose at Purpose.org. Is there anywhere else or anything else they should be checking out, Jeremy? No, that's, uh, that's it. There's, there's, uh, there's, you can't miss the book. Um, <laughs> the only thing that's fun is that uh, it's published in so many countries, there are many different covers. So you kind of, you know, you can pick your cover and your national edition, but in Australia, uh, it's black with yellow letters. Yes, it, it is a very distinctive book. And um, every time I walk past an airport news agent or bookstore, it is very much at the front and center. So congratulations, my man. Best of luck with the best, with the rest of the book tour. And I hope to catch you in Australia sometime. Thank you, Steve. It's been a real pleasure. Great conversation. Cheers, mate. If you'd like to receive a weekly email from me, complete with reflections, books I've been reading, words of wisdom, and access to blogs, ebooks, and more that we're publishing on a regular basis, just head over to futuresquared.xyz forward slash subscribe and you'll get the very next one. If you're picking up what I'm putting down, please take a minute to like, share, or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or Google Play. It goes a long way to giving the podcast the exposure it needs so I can continue bringing you guests and conversations of the highest caliber. This episode was powered by Collective Campus. Until next time, Future Squared is out.